Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, what a nice crowd. We're delighted you're here. Uh, my name is Larry Lederman, and uh, I am the chair of the Ambassador Speaker Series at Carleton University. And welcome to the fourth and final session in this academic year. Before introducing our featured speaker, the Ambassador of the U European Union, Her Excellency Marianne Koninsk, I would like to first recognize some of our guests. And um, please forgive me if I haven't mentioned you, please raise your hand. <laughs> only, only diplomatics are known, not, not you. Not you. <laughs> I would first like to introduce the newly arrived ambassador of Ukraine, His Excellency Andriy Shevchenko and his wife, Anna, who are back there. And, um, and uh, the ambassador of Armenia, His Excellency Armin Yeganian, the Ambassador de la France, Son Excellence Nicolas Chapuis, l'Ambassador d'Algérie, Son Excellence Hossein Megar, the Ambassador of Panama, His Excellency Alberta Rosemena, the Ambassador of Venezuela, His Excellency Wilmer Omar Barriento Fernandez, the Ambassador of Indonesia, His Excellency Toiko Faisrasaya, the uh, Ambassador of Cyprus, who has most recently arrived, His Excellency Paulos Anastasiana, the Ambassador of Moldova, Her Excellency Ala Belevshi, the Ambassador of Egypt, His Excellency Motaz Tsaran, the Ambassador of Guatemala, Her Excellency Rita Claveri de Scioli, the Ambassador of Costa Rica, His Excellency Roberto Dormon, uh, the Ambassador of Serbia, His Excellency Mihailo Papazoglu, the Ambassador of Kazakhstan, His Excellency Konstantin Zigalov, the Ambassador of Georgia, His Excellency Alexander Latsabitsi, the Ambassador of Peru, so ex his, Her Excellency Marcela Lopez Bravo, um, the High Commissioner of St. Kitts and Nevis, Shirley Skerritt Andrew, and the Ambassador of Israel, Rafael Barak, is here. The Ambassador of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Her Excellency Kovlija Spiric, and the Ambassador of Spain, Carlos Mejia. I'm delighted to see you. And finally, the High Commissioner, Her Excellency of Jamaica, Janice Miller. Thank you. Well, <laughs> I don't see Vanessa. Is she here from... Ah, and the Acting High Commissioner of Trinidad and Tobago, Vanessa Ramit Ramroop. Well, we have two places we can go on holiday this winter. Um, I'm also welcoming uh, uh, former Canadian ambassadors, if you will be patient for one more moment. Uh, the Canadian ambassador, former Canadian ambassador to the OAS in Chile, Paul Durand. Former Canadian Chargé d'Affaires d'Ecuador, Jack Kepper, if he's there. Former Canadian ambassador to Russia and Ukraine, Chris Westall and his wife, Sheila. Uh, former Canadian Ambassador to Finland, Craig McDonald, former Canadian Ambassador to Kazakhstan, Margaret Skok, and also representatives of the Canadian government, including Global Affairs, Health Canada, students and faculty of the University of Ottawa, and uh, Carleton University. So now, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the Dean of Public Affairs of Carleton University, André Pleur, who will introduce our distinguished speaker, André. Thank you, thank you, Larry. Uh, bienvenue à l'Université Carleton, bienvenue à la Faculté des Affaires Publiques. Donc, c'est un plaisir pour moi de vous accueillir uh, ici ce soir. So, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our distinguished speaker, the Ambassador of the European Union, Her Excellency Marianne Canex. Ambassador Kanex studied law at Ghent University in Belgium, followed by postgraduate studies in international and European law at Cambridge University and at the Uni European University Center in Nancy, France. She began her career in the European Commission in 1984, where she spent the next 12 years working for the Commissioner for External Relations, the Trade Commissioner responsible for internal market and relations with the European Parliament, and for the Commissioner responsible for development policy and relations with the European Parliament. She was then posted to the European Union delegation in New York as Minister Counselor, and in 2000 as Minister Counselor at the European Union delegation in Geneva. In 2004, 
Ambassador Conanx was appointed head of unit at the External Relations Department of the European Commission, responsible for relations between the European Union and Latin America. Five years later, she was named EU Ambassador to Mexico. In 2013, she was appointed U European Ambassador to Canada. Please welcome the Ambassador of the, of the European Union to Canada, Her Excellency Marianne Connex. Good evening, uh, bonsoir. Uh, um, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I, I must say that I'm extremely pleased to see so many of colleagues and friends here, and I really, I really uh, appreciate it. Um, I would like particularly to thank Carlton University and Larry Lederman, in particular, for giving me this opportunity to speak to address this uh, distinguished audience. I would like to say that this is a very, very timely discussion that uh, we have. And it took me two years to convince uh, Larry to invite me to this series. <laughs> but I finally managed. And I'm grateful that I'm only coming now, Larry, because the timing of this discussion could not be better. I think it's a timely discussion for mainly two reasons. First of all, uh, to put the record straight on what the European Union is. And that's the title, the strengths and the challenges. Um, because I think that uh, today, in particular, the European Union, Europe, is associated with crisis uh, or being defined as disintegrating, collapsing. And uh, there is a lot of misperception what the European Union is. And just to give you an example, I was uh, last week with a group of ambassadors colleagues in Alberta. And uh, I was asked by a young group of professionals of the Canadian International Council if they could meet uh, with me to discuss about Europe. Because they said, is the European Union really in as much trouble as media, especially here in North America, makes us believe? You can imagine my answer to that question. So in the first place, I think it's absolutely necessary to give a more realistic picture of what the European Union is. And the second reason uh, that's a timely discussion is it's an excellent moment to give good visibility to a very, very strong partnership between the European Union uh, and uh, Canada, and especially since this year we are celebrating our 40th anniversary. So I will have two parts in my, my presentation. First one, European Union, and the second one, which will be smaller on EU-Canada partnership. I think that in order to understand what the European Union is, how it works, um, I would like to give a short overview. And I will be travel briefly in time, and I promise to be briefly, I will not go back to the Middle Ages, but only 70 years ago, and I would say uh, it's a generation of our grandparents or parents, and then against the generation of my parents. And the European Union, the European continent, has known uh, two world, world wars, uh, which were the old wars are terrible, but I think this was one of the worst in humankind. It destroyed the, the continent, it made people suffering. There were uh, thousand millions of uh, victims, people killed, pain, misery, and a lot of refugees. And only five years later, in 1915, uh, we were lucky to have some brilliant politicians, such as Robert Schumann and Konrad Adenauer, who came together and said, we have to find a solution to avoid peace, uh, to avoid war and guarantee peace in future. And they had the idea to, to create more cooperation, to have a united uh, Europe based on solidarity, where people would be living in peace, prosperity, in security, and, and freedom. And for the very first time in our history, former enemies came together, pooling uh, their part of their sovereignty together, um, to put uh, notably their coal and steel industry under one uh, autonomous um, supranational authority, and you can ask why coal and steel, but coal and steel at that time were the industries of the war. And it was the first time in the, in the history that they were ready to fight for a common interest. And I think all these things may not be forgotten and has to be uh, remembered. And particularly uh, the example, the unmatched example that the European Union offers in history, an example of cooperation against confrontation, 
compromise against conflict, freedom against oppression. An example, I would say, that is far from fading or collapsing and is all the more relevant in these difficult times. So the European Union, what is the European Union today? What have we realized? 70 years ago, I think that nobody would have realized that Europe could succeed and that we would have achieved what we have achieved today. We started small as uh, an economic community with six uh, countries, and we developed in an economic and political uh, union. Today we have 28 member states with more than 500 million people. Uh, a union that I would say is one of the most peaceful, most secure, prosperous, and democratic areas in the world. And which means that in a space of only um, two generations, the European Union has become a big economic player that participates in shaping uh, the world. It's the world's largest economy. It's the most integrated and competitive market in the world. I always say, if you make it there, you make it anywhere. Uh, it's the largest trade bloc. Uh, it's the first trading partner of 80 countries uh, in the world. Compared, for example, with the US, the US is the first trading partner of about 20 countries in the world. We are the biggest importer and exporter of services. We are the biggest investor and recipients of investors investments in the world. We are the largest, together with our member states, the largest donor of development assistance and humanitarian aid. And we are an active player promoting peace and security around the world and a norm setting setter regarding promoting human rights. And I would like to stress and remind that it's not a coincidence that in 2012, the European Union was awarded the Peace Nobel Prize. And the reasons, and I quote, for its contribution over six decades to advancements of peace and reconciliation, democracy and human, right, or, and human rights. It's not a coincidence that we remain a model around the world and a source of attraction in our neighborhood. Um, there are different regional uh, organizations who look at the European Union experience in regional uh, integration, for example, the African Union, Association of South American Asian Countries, Central American countries. That's one reason. Uh, another uh, is that uh, when I refer uh, to Ukraine, I think that the people in Maidan uh, Square stood up uh, for the European Union and its values, and this is a cost of great sacrifice and suffering. And you might be surprised, but there are still many countries who would like to join the European Union. I will not speak of some who might leave it, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's a union which is, is very uh, attractive. The challenges and, and responsibles, as foreseen as, as Robert Schumann, uh, the then Minister of Foreign Affairs of, of France, he said that Europe will not be made uh, at once, uh, but it will be built step by step. And I think this is the process, it's our history, and we got periods of uh, reflection, uh, periods of setbacks, uh, periods where we make a lot of progress. And uh, today, I would say uh, what we are confronted is uh, economic challenges, violence in our closest neighborhood, refugee crisis, and the fight against terrorism. I would like particularly mention two particular challenges and the responsibles that we have given or are given. There is the financial and economic challenge, and I particularly will say a word more on the crisis and uh, migration uh, challenge. The financial and economic challenge, I think in 2008, Europe was hit by the worst economic downturn since the 30s, and, and you all know, and I repeat it, the problems did not start uh, in Europe. The, the, the problem started here with your southern neighbor, uh, and affected uh, the, the European Union and why uh, we are open financial markets and our economies are, much, are very much interlinked. Moreover, we had a difficulty in the European Union that we have a special supranational uh, national status with complex structure which not always adapt very quickly to new uh, situations. And it's a fact that uh, some member states were harder hit than, than others for different reasons because of their internal economic situation. 
And also, we speak a lot about financial crisis, but in fact, it was more a debt crisis of uh, some countries. And I say some countries because some member states were in crisis where others were not, and that's very often uh, forgotten. And also, not the European Union or the Euro uh, were in crisis. And this I repeat often uh, because this is often misrepresented in the press and in uh, reality. And for the moment, we don't have a euro crisis anymore, but I still am invited to many conferences, and particularly in the academic world, speaking about the ex uh, euro crisis. So it's something uh, which often attracts people to speak about the crisis on our continent. Uh, I must say that, uh, the, that we have effectively dealt uh, with this um, financial and economic uh, shock, and um, over the last five years, the, the member states have agreed to very substantial reforms, very substantial reforms which all have meant more integration. Uh, we have lay, laid the foundation for a single financial market, an integrated banking union, deepening fiscal and budgetary uh, coordination. So in practice, uh, over the last years, Europe has not faced any disintegration on the contrary. Uh, member states agreed to a significant transfer of competence to deeper economic and political integration. And these adjustments are bringing uh, fruits and bringing results. And I just want to mention uh, regarding the progress which has been made. Progress has been made in improving the stability of the Eurozone. Uh, there is an overall recovery of the economic, of the economy and the overall picture of the economic growth is an encouraging one, with a positive growth predicted or taking place in a majority of our member states. I would say in all member states, with the exception of uh, Greece. And also, I would like to point to the fact that several of our EU member states who were in deep trouble had very big uh, economic difficulties are now, now doing very well. Let, let me mention Ireland. Uh, Ireland is, I read in, in some of the research I was doing, is, is not only the fast growing economy in Europe, but some say it's even the fast growing economy in the world, where they had last year a growth of 7.8%. Uh, Spain, Carlos, uh, a growth of 2.8%. Uh, Portugal also doing well. And then there are other economies who are not in crisis in the European Union. Major economies like Poland uh, also have a growth of 3.5%. So I would say that the overall picture is, is positive and the, certainly the Eurozone economy uh, is starting to recover. And why? Because of reforms that has been implemented and that improved fiscal uh, discipline that now is in place. Does it mean that everything went smoothly? Does it mean that we don't have any more difficulties? The answer is clearly no. But the examples that I give is uh, that uh, it's not for the first time that we have been facing significant great challenges in our history. And as in the past, and is a permanent experience of the European Union, we always have come more integrated and stronger after such a crisis. But why the European Union, again, is associated, associated with the crisis in these days? I would say that we are facing a serious refugee and migration challenge, and it's one of the hardest tests of our uh, European Union history. And the challenges for the European Union are enormous. If you only look at, at the figures, we have only last year, we have 1.3 million asylum seekers and refugees that entered the European Union. It's estimated that the total figure of people entering uh, is even more, that it might have been 1.5 to 1.8 million people only in 2015. The two first months of 2016, uh, 135,000 have, have entered. And, and why do they want to come? Why are they entering the, the European Union? I think there are different reasons. The most uh, maybe obvious one is the geographical situation. We are not blessed, like in Canada, to have two oceans, uh, the east and the west of, uh, of the European Union. Uh, we have a turbulent neighborhood, 
Uh, we have we are very close to countries and regions which are marked by crisis, uh, war, and, and poverty. Poverty is particularly when I point to, to Northern Africa. And also an important reason why they want to come to Europe is that we are an open society. We're an open society that respect and protect human rights, uh, human dignity and vulnerable people. And we are also a prosperous society. I think that we can afford, we want to help people in need and we can afford to, have peop to help uh, people. And we're doing our utmost best uh, in addressing these uh, challenges and therefore uh, we have developed over the last month a very complex and comprehensive uh, strategy that is focusing on the urgency of the matter, but also taking measures in the medium and the long term. I would say that the main measures is that internally that we are assisting all member states, but particularly those member states who have been overwhelmed by the, the situation to help them to cope with this huge influx uh, of migrants, uh, of refugees, we start, or we will be relocating, uh, starting with 160,000 refugees among our member states. A very important part of our strategy is the reinforcement of the external borders, which is absolutely necessary. Uh, you know the Schengen system. The Schengen system uh, is uh, a system whereby we have, we have abolished uh, the internal borders, but under the condition to strengthen the external borders. And we have to do it more uh, for different reasons, including for security reasons, but also to facilitate and to speed up the identification uh, and processing of asylum uh, requests, which also means that the quicker sending back of economic um, um, migrants, so those uh, who are not uh, in need of, of asylum uh, protection. Externally, uh, we are providing very substantial assistance to neighboring countries who host thousands, if not millions, uh, of uh, refugees. We are supporting Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey, and also substantial humanitarian assistance inside Syria. Uh, we are, and this is more directed to the um, economic migrants coming from Africa, we are on top of the substantial development assistance that we are giving, we are even doing more uh, to help the countries of origin of these um, refugees, these migrants. And recently uh, we have agreed of a framework of an agreement with Turkey in order for having a better control of the irregular flows and facilitating asylum for, for Syrians. This agreement will be discussed and, and probably confirmed the end of this week. Uh, there will be another special European uh, Council. European Council is a meeting of European heads of states in, in Brussels. And beside that, we are together with other partners also participating uh, in contributing, getting a peace process, because I think that if the peace uh, could be achieved in some of these, these countries, that that automatically would stop people fleeing uh, from, from that. So it's a very complex strategy, and we will ne need time, patience, and political will to implement it. The problem is that we do not always have a lot of time to implement it. And why is this crisis, I would say, so different from the previous ones? Why is this a much more harder challenge than the previous that we have known? It's the magnitude of the, of the, the problem. Uh, it's the huge uh, influx of, of people. I'm not referring to the 1.3 million in 2015, but to give you another example, in Sweden uh, last year, and Sweden is a country of t 10 million inhabitants, which is about one third of Canada, they had in two months, less than two months' time, they received 30,000 unaccompanied minors. Uh, who entered, uh, which is a complete new situation, uh, complicated one, children, no family, uh, they need extra protection and they have different needs. And this is only one uh, example. Another difficulty was we have legal uh, structures dealing with asylum. Um, uh, in, in place in the European Union, we, we have the Schengen Code for border free travel, we have the Dublin Convention, and these work all in times, what I call in good weather times, or in normal conditions they can function. For example, the Dublin Convention for Asylum foresees that when a person wants to apply for asylum, they have to apply it in the first country they enter in the European Union. 
in other words, they cannot choose which country they want to, to go to to apply for, for asylum. They have to do it in the first country of asylum. Now, which countries do they enter? It was mainly, uh, I would say, in, in Greece and Italy. So you cannot expect that uh, uh, they would all stay there and apply and apply these rules. These rules have to be uh, uh, adapted uh, for, uh, for it. Um, another reason why it's such a difficult crisis is that we have some member states in the European Union we have, uh, who have much more experience with migrations and refugees than other ones. Uh, we had refugees in the past, the Vietnamese uh, boat people, we had many of them. We had former Yugoslavia, we had many uh, uh, also uh, in, in the 90s. But we have some member states in the European Union who came out of isolation, uh, which came from the Soviet bloc uh, and just 20 years ago, uh, and facing such issue for the first time. And their population is not used to this kind of uh, a situation, and there was a kind of creation of fear and insecurity among the population. And there are many other reasons, but I would say um, it, it's a very, very complicated uh, situation, which is also a test of the functioning of the European Union and how we can react. Now, the question is, will we succeed? And uh, I am sure we have to succeed, and we will succeed. And we have to succeed, and here I, I read a very interesting speech that uh, Minister Schäuble, he's the Minister of Finance of Germany, he gave in London uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And he said, we have to succeed. We, we cannot make refugees pay the price for Europe's inability to take effective actions. We simply have the duty to help because of the hardship that these people are experiencing, which we can mitigate. So we have to help them. We have to succeed. We will succeed also because we have to put also this situation in historic perspective. And I don't know, but we have a lot of interesting film festivals here also in, in, uh, in Ottawa. And I recently saw a couple of films at the occasion of the Nordic and Baltic uh, Film Festival where there were a lot addressing the, uh, the World War II uh, and the aftermath. And it was a, a really impressive film which demonstrated that um, after, the, um, after the World War II, uh, Germany alone had to cope with 12 to 14 million refugees and displaced person. It was a film of, about Estonia that, that I saw. And uh, they went to, to Germany uh, in situations, they came there in cities where completely wound. 12 to 14 refugees, million uh, refugees and displaced person. Some of them went to Canada, Australia, and other places. But uh, I mean, the, the, the bulk of it stayed in, in Germany. So just to say, uh, in perspective, we are only speaking here about one to two, two point uh, million and happening in a situation where we have the means to deal uh, with uh, this, this uh, issue. We can help them. We also have succeed because it's the permanence a lesson of the European Union that when we stick together, when we stay united, we are successful and we do succeed. Uh, and we say, l'union fait la force. It's by coincidence also a motto of Belgium, which I am. Uh, and not always in Belgium, it's easy to keep uh, united. But particularly in the European Union, I think we have uh, to stick uh, uh, together. And finally, I think we will succeed because it's our experience, and I said it before, uh, we had great challenges in the past, but each time, each time, without any exception, we have come out stronger and more united out of it. A last consideration regarding the refugee crisis. I want to stress also that the refugee crisis is not a Greek, it's not an Italian, it's not a German, it's not a European problem, it's a global challenge. And therefore, we count on responsibility and others within the region and outside the, the region. And uh, we know that many countries around the world, including, as I said, in the region itself, are not doing enough. Uh, and even some close their doors altogether 
or do not grant the status of refugee to those landers on their shores. So this, I repeat, is a global uh, responsibility and allow me to express your appreciation for the efforts that Canada uh, has been doing uh, up to now already by receiving uh, 25,000 uh, refugees and the substantial humanitarian aid it is given. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a, a final word on the strengths and challenges of the European Union. Um, it's true that uh, we are faced with uh, a magnitude uh, of a huge refugee crisis, but, uh, uh, and maybe the European Union is shaking, but we are not crumbling, we are not collapsing, and I'm confident that the European Union will emerge stronger than before. And again, my experience of Alberta last week, um, you know, Alberta's situation, economic situation, is not an easy one. But everywhere, and I think also my colleague from Israel can confirm that everywhere where we went, they said, we consider every challenge as an opportunity. And now I have decided I use this phrase also in my speeches. Every challenge is an opportunity. I come now to the second part uh, about a European Union-Canada strategic partnership. Um, which is a success story, a big success story, I would say. Uh, we have, 40 years ago, in 76, we signed a framework agreement on economic uh, cooperation. At that time, it was the first uh, agreement that the then European community concluded with an industrialized uh, country. And at the time, it was a very innovative uh, and ambitious agreement. And in the meantime, uh, our relationship has been growing into a very strong uh, partnership and also friendship, I, I would say, which has benefited uh, our people. We work with Canada closely together also in other frameworks like G7, G20, NATO. Um, and today the European Union is the second largest trading partner and the second biggest investor in Canada. Uh, European investments in Canada have nearly quadrupled over the last 10 years. And to give a comparison, Canada is the 12th largest trading partner of the European Union and the fourth, invest, the fourth investor in, in, um, in Europe. And also Canadian investments have nearly tripled over the last uh, 10 years. We both consider, Canada and the European Union, that promoting trade is a motor for growth and for employment. And uh, therefore, we are very pleased that we have reached an agreement on a comprehensive economic and trade agreement, the famous CETA agreement, which is the most ambitious agreement that ever the European Union of Canada have concluded. And today we are finalizing another milestone agreement, which is the strategic partnership agreement or the SPA agreement, which mainly will uh, intensify already existing cooperation between European Union and Canada in addressing global challenges. Uh, give me, uh, allow me to give a few examples. Um, in the field of climate change, environment and energy, um, we work together, uh, we have dialogues on, on climate change, but particularly with this government, we are very pleased that uh, we have uh, worked together and I'm also glad our French colleague is here. I think that uh, we work together to make the climate summit in Paris a success. And we are now closely working together for its implementation. We are also working that the new file is on the file of energy, uh, where we like to stimulate clean energy, re renewable energy, energy efficiency, and for us, in particularly important, energy security. Energy security, why? Because the European Union, we are not blessed like Canada to have these huge resources. Uh, we import more than 55% of our energy sometimes not always from stable uh, 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 sources. And we want to diversify, and we are very hard working on what is called an energy union, but also, uh, which was also clear coming uh, in, in Alberta, uh, Canada also wants to diversify, wants to diversify having new, new markets, and I think that uh, there we can work uh, closely together. Another field which is a success story is our cooperation in the field of science, technology, and innovation. This year we celebrate also the 20th anniversary of the EU-Canada uh, Agreement on Scientific and Technology Cooperation. Uh, we have, uh, the European Union has a program uh, which is called Horizon 2020. It's an 
80 billion euros program of cooperation worldwide, and among the top, uh, among the 100 third countries which participate in the program, Canada is among the top 10 of uh, cooperation. And a special feature that we also have together with US, Canada, and the European Union, that we have a special cooperation and research on Arctic and maritime uh, uh, issues, the Arctic being also one of our key policies. A last example of cooperation in the geo, uh, geopolitical field and security challenges. As a close ally, we work very uh, uh, close together also addressing um, geopolitical and security challenges. And an example, I think that uh, we, we have a common interest together that the integrity of borders of sovereign states uh, are respected. And here we have aligned our, pos aligned our position towards Russia by imposing uh, sanctions, and we are united in supporting the Ukraine. We also work together jointly in the fight against terrorism, and we work already a lot together in so-called peacekeeping missions. Canada participated or is participating in seven um, by the European Union-led military of civil uh, civilian missions around the world, ranging from Ukraine, occupied Palestinian territories, to Afghanistan, uh, and to Kosovo. Canada is the only non-European country that participates in European Union electoral observation missions, and we work closely together in international fora, such as in the UN. In brief, we uh, have already very strong ties and very strong cooperation with Canada, and I cannot also say that uh, I cannot um, not mention the Education Centre being here at, at the university. And we believe that uh, thanks to the agreements of CETA and SPA, uh, we, this cooperation will be even strengthened uh, more. In conclusion, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, in the last 40 years uh, that we have our agreement in 76, uh, Canada has changed, Europe has changed, and the world have, have changed, has become more complex. And we are dealing with complex challenges, and which means that uh, uh, simple illusions, are, simple solutions are an illusion. And it's also clear that in today's complex world, challenges cannot be tackled in isolation. Um, we need a coherent and coordinated action, and therefore cooperation among partners, uh, among close allies, is absolutely key. And we welcome the approach of the new uh, Canadian government uh, with its focus on multilateralism and cooperation uh, with partners. And I would like to end with a quote. Uh, when Prime Minister Justine Trudeau participated on the 18th of February at our reception at the occasion of 40 years anniversary of the EU delegation in Ottawa, he said, in a world of shifting global power, it's more important than ever to leverage the Canadian-European partnership to advance our common values and interests. Thank you. Hello, Ambassador. Thank you very much for a, a wonderful overview of Europe and our relationship with Canada. Uh, my name is Mark Fleming, and I work with a company called Johnson & Johnson. Um, you have INTA here in Ottawa next week. You can't take them skating on the uh, canal. Uh, what, what will you be doing with the, uh, the Trade Committee next week here in Ottawa? Maybe for the public, INTA, that is a parliamentary committee uh, dealing with trade of the European Parliament. Uh, we will have, and particularly in this uh, year, we will have in the near future four parliamentary committees coming to, to Canada. But the INTA committee, the Committee for Trade of the European Parliament, mainly comes to speak uh, about the CETA uh, agreement. In our system, the European Parliament will play an absolute key role uh, in ratifying uh, the, the CETA agreement, because when the parliaments say yes uh, to the agreement, then uh, it sets the, the light on green for the, uh, the provisional implementation of the CETA agreement. And therefore, I think that they are coming uh, also to, to discuss with their counterparts. Uh, with, they will have a meeting with the Minister of, of Trade and uh, with the Trade Committee of, of the Canadian uh, Parliament. I personally think that um, since we solved a quite a delicate and complicated issue of the investment protection, since that is, I think, solved, that that definitely will facilitate uh, the discussions. Thank you.
I had Percy Abels, formerly from Foreign Affairs. I've got a very sensitive question because I've been following it in for the last little while. Its name is Brexit. What's going to happen? What what are the contingency plans? How do you see this evolving? What is the likelihood of Cameron losing that uh, ballot in June? And if, should he lose it, how is that going to affect the EU? How is it going to affect even Britain? Because Scotland's made it very clear they want to stay part of the EU. Uh, it's It's a really very, very messy situation from what I can see. So I'd like to hear your opinion, how you see that evolving and where it might go. Thank you. I thought you were going to ask me a question about the result of the German election. Vielen <laughs> <laughs> Dank. Um, you, you, you have to understand that I cannot comment on an internal issue of a member state. Uh, I cannot comment on the referendum uh, of, of the UK. Uh, I can only speak here in, in a personal uh, capacity um, that uh, I think that uh, uh, it, uh, the UK is a very important, all member states are equally important, uh, UK is also an important uh, partner and uh, I think that it will be for everybody beneficial uh, if they would stay within the European Union. But I think you must understand me and that I cannot say more about it. My name is Andriy Shevchenko. I'm the Ukrainian ambassador. Your Excellency, first I would like to strongly subscribe to your words of the European Union as a very attractive concept. There are some EU skeptics across the Union to whom the EU is Brussels bureaucracy and some uh, risk of losing national pride. But for many millions outside of the EU, uh, when you hear EU, it means respect to human dignity, human rights, this concept of open society, and this is something that can be worth of sacrificing your comfort, health, and even life for. But my question is about more practical things. It's about your negotiations on free trade and trade between EU and uh, Canada. Last week in Alberta, I was struck by your comment or your response to a business woman who said, well, we don't really believe in trade deals because it's mostly for big companies not for small or mid-sized businesses. I think you had some very con convincing points to, to talk in response. So how do you sell this treaty in Canada and in the European Union? Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. I really don't think we have to sell it. It's such a popular agreement. Um, and particularly, I would say, here, here in, in, in Canada, uh, I was struck when I arrived here in September 2013. Uh, everybody knew CETA. Uh, the negotiations were then still going on, to an extent that I said, well, we have other things than CETA, than trade in our relations with Canada, thinking about all the other successful corporations that, that, that we have working in all, all these fields. But uh, I quickly understood that um, uh, particularly when we then had a political breakthrough uh, on the CETA, which happened in October 2013, one month after the, that I arrived, also being very lucky that it happened, I noticed that, uh, first of all, it had two effects. First of all, that everybody, the Canadians, spoke very positively about the European Union. Um, they were saying uh, it's an important agreement, it will give us uh, an access to a market of 500 million, a competitive market, etc. So a very positive Im image which came from the Canadians themselves about the European Union. And secondly, I was impressed uh, how the Canadians uh, have uh, the Minister of Trade at that time, Ed Fast, he went to all the provinces. They have excellent uh, publicity material to demonstrate the benefits that CETA will bring for each one and every, everybody. And I'm, I'm personally convinced that it will bring huge benefits uh, and also, I have, together with my colleagues, we have been traveling uh, around Canada and visiting the provinces, and I seldom heard any critic uh, regarding the CETA agreement. It's really considered as something, as a win-win um, uh, agreement for, for everybody. It will bring huge benefits for both sides, uh, as it might be very evident that it will bring advantages for Canadians because uh, a, a huge access to a facilitating access to a huge market. I think also for Europeans it will bring a lot of benefits uh, and uh, also in, in Europe I think there is there is an interest to, to promote this. We had several business missions uh, which already uh, came because um, 
the business, and we have been advocating that also, business should not wait until we have the CETA agreement into force. They should already now be in the starting blocks, and uh, some of our uh, member states, uh, several one have already used that occasion, and in October uh, last year, we had a, a very important uh, Belgium uh, mission which went to British uh, Columbia. And they had asked me because they had organized a conference on CETA. They had not asked me because I was Belgium. Um, and they, uh, the Belgium ambassador got a question. Uh, he was with a business mission of 220 business people and was led, we are in, we have, it was led by the Belgium, a Belgian princess, which is a, a normal uh, procedure in, in, in Belgium. And uh, he was asked, uh, why British Columbia? Uh, do you have a lot of trade, Belgium, uh, British Columbia? He said, no, not yet. Um, so they especially went to a, a province uh, where they are very hopeful and confident that thanks to the CETA agreement also, they will have a new business and investment opportunities. And the mission was extremely uh, successful. And, and I know that the other uh, member states countries also, uh, which are having or will be having uh, business uh, uh, mission. So I think it's really, uh, uh, really uh, a very important, ambitious agreement which will bring benefits to everybody. I hope that answers your questions. Good evening. Thank I'm you sorry. very much for your uh, comprehensive presentation. Indeed, the uh, European Union is, uh, let's say, a success story. It has a lot of achievement, but at the same time, it's very difficult to handle 28 states members with different weights, interests, but indeed there is a, uh, the willingness to be together. But more importantly, can you, can, you, can you elaborate on the oversight of the common foreign policy of the European Union? Mm -hmm. Because you refer to the uh, migrant crisis that you're suffering now, and you're told that maybe it's part of the uh, poverty in certain regions, but also it's part of uh, turbulences at the geographical level. So if we, there is uh, an efficient common f foreign policy, it will uh, be influential on the resolution of some conflicts. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that? Because I think it's a key issue. Then it seems that uh, one weak point of the European <laughs> Union is the lack of uh, unity in terms of economic cooperation, and this especially regulation pertaining to national budgets. Can you tell us something about that? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would say we have already a common uh, security and, and defense uh, policy, uh, uh, which we have. A, we had a, an important agreement, uh, the Lisbon Treaty, uh, about six years ago, uh, which has given an additional booster to it. And it's still a sector which uh, I think is, is growing, but we are marking successes in, in it uh, as well. And uh, the European Union, and particularly, I would say, in the persons of uh, Mrs. Mogherini, uh, is, is very active uh, in, in trying to play uh, a role in trying to solve some of, of the, the crisis uh, situation. I know, for example, uh, that uh, she has been playing, and also a predecessor, a very positive role uh, in, in uh, Kosovo and, and Serbia, uh, bringing the two parties uh, together. Um, she played, uh, and together also uh, with um, the uh, E3 countries, uh, a, a decisive role in also bringing a deal on the nuclear uh, deal in, in Iran together uh, with European countries, uh, France, Germany, and, and the UK. And I think that the role there of the European Union has been recognized as, uh, as, a, uh, as a broker of, of the deal. And I think that she is also now extremely busy uh, with Libya, uh, trying also there to give support to this. Uh, it's absolutely key and urgent to have as quickly as possible to have uh, a government uh, there, because if the Libyan crisis is not solved, uh, this is really could give rise to a major wave of, of uh, refugees uh, again, because if you have a stateless uh, country, just uh, at the border of the of the 
uh, Mediterranean, where easily all the mainly economic migrants could come uh, from, from, from Africa. This is a major problem, so everybody is working together, including also uh, Canada has a huge interest. So I think we're already playing uh, a role uh, in dealing uh, with uh, foreign policy, with common security and, and, uh, the, and defense uh, policy. By the way, we will have an important uh, conference coming up on the 27th of April here in, in Canada uh, on the common security and defense policy at which Mrs. Mogherini will participate. So we will be sending out, um, we will be sending out invitations for that. A lack of cooperation regarding national budgets. I think one of the results of the financial crisis, of the budget crisis, was exactly that we have been uh, strengthening um, cooperation and uh, fiscal um, uh, oversight of and including of the budget. I always give the example as, as a Belgium uh, that, uh, I mean, the, the, there are new rules in place which, um, the, by which the European Commission has to give its green light, has to check the national budget for to see if the deficit is not, not too big. And it does not prevent member states to have a huge deficit, but in that case they will be pe penalized. Now, I'm Belgian, and I'm a proud Belgian, proud European. Um, in Belgium, we had for about 500 days no government. Um, and when we had, when they had reached one year no government, there were parties all over Belgium to celebrate that we had no government for one year. <laughs> but joke apart, um, we were forced to have a government because the caretaking government had to take a number of austerity measures. They could not t take it as a, as a take-caring government. They needed a real government. And that has really accelerated uh, the formation of, of federal government. So I think already there is, uh, regarding in any case, uh, the, there is an oversight on, on national uh, budget in the sides of controlling the, the national uh, deficits. And the deficit has been a major problem of, of the crisis. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, to me, you are a rock star. <laughs> I have listened to you. This is the third time. And every time you speak, I really enjoy your sharings with us. And I'm very glad that there is cooperation between the European Union and Canada, especially if you put your heads with our resources, we can certainly bring a lot of wealth and joy to both of us. The question that I want to ask you about Brexit Britain's main issue is not refugees. Uh, we cannot be politically correct here. We must state the, the, the problem as it is. They are concerned about terrorist infiltration. One in a thousand spoils the whole batch. That's, that's the British problem. And if that can be resolved, and I believe there is a possibility for resolution of it, it was proposed by an Egyptian billionaire his scheme was to buy an island and basically receive all these immigrants or all these refugees into this island, but he would have sovereignty over the island. Of course, that cannot be accepted, but there is no reason why the United Nations and the European Union cannot come together and provide the funds to purchase a couple of Greek islands. They will solve their <laughs> problems with finances, and perhaps the refugee problem will be also solved, just as a, a, a staging place until these refugees are documented and until they understand the meaning of citizenship before they can be integrated in the rest of the in the rest of Europe and the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you. I've never been called a rock star. That's the first time. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And I enjoyed last time when we had a conversation on citizenship. I think that speaking about the, the refugees um, and there, there might have been, and there are some problems of uh, of security. That's, uh, I mean, these these are proven. It's it's a theme of a little bit of taboo, and uh, we are recommended not to speak about it because it might give the impression that we use the argument of security and terrorist threats uh, to uh, build a wall uh, around uh, Europe and not let let them in. So that that's not correct. I think that we are working very hard. Uh, also, uh, and there is a serious problem, for example, also again in Belgium, we have the highest levels uh, of Syria uh, fighters uh, within uh, of all the member states of the European Union. I think there are really efforts being done 
uh, for the security situation, and I think one of the main elements to be done is to get a cooperation uh, amongst the, the security services, which are still uh, lacking, uh, lacking seriously, and plus there are other measures which are, are taking. But coming back to the to the, secure, to the refugee crisis, um, having read also, and, and this is also why this crisis is so difficult, this is a crisis with a human face. You see the, 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 the people suffering, and I would say that a vast, vast majority Majority, if you listen to their stories, uh, and I read a very interesting article written by a, a German doctor who uh, went uh, to um, the places within Germany where they arrived. If you listen to their stories, they really, I mean, they have horror sp stories uh, behind them, and they really have been fleeing for, for their life, and uh, uh, and they will probably also uh, be marked for, for, for their further life. So, I mean, uh, I think it's... Uh, we, we have a duty uh, to, to take care of them unless uh, the, the problems are, are solved in, in the region. I personally believe it's a much better situation, if possible, to keep them close in the region. Uh, it's very good, and I, I really praise Canada that they take up, uh, and I would encourage even to take up more. Um, but many of these people, they would like to go back one day uh, when the situation gets better, and, and the closer they are, uh, to home, I would say, the better it is, the easier it is to, to return them when the situation uh, is there. And this is why also we're having now these uh, discussions with Turkey, trying also uh, to have the people in, in the region, but in decent conditions, so that they really, uh, in this time that they are refugees, they have all the... the everything they, they, they need to have a decent, uh, a decent uh, life. I said, I... I, I Again, I cannot comment on the, on the British referendum, and I hope you understand. Thank you. Joanna Ostrojansky, Institute of European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. And you mentioned Ukraine earlier. How is the EU facilitating negotiations between Russia and Ukraine? From my understanding, there are trade talks right now between them, and that the EU is playing a role in facilitating that. I think our colleague from... Uh, <laughs> from Ukraine, might be better. To uh, uh, we we are trying to facilitate also these these discussions, and 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 we believe that. Uh, uh, we had offered this this association agreement with with, with Ukraine, and it was uh, made them. The, the reaction of made them of the people was exactly because then the president, then president, he refused to sign this association agreement, and then we had uh, this astonishing reaction from the Ukrainian uh, people. And uh, I think that we are doing everything uh, with all means, including with with, with trade, uh, uh, to to help. Uh, uh, Ukraine and of course every country makes its own choice if they want to have an association agreement if they want uh, later to join the European or not that's not we will never ask a country to become a member of the European Union um, but we will definitely try in, in, in the difficult situation uh, that uh, Ukraine is uh, to help by all, all means and also by cooperation to help them for example uh, with uh, the, the system with the rule of law, the fight against corruption, and so there are many, many corporations that, that are, are, are going on. And uh, in that framework, I said, I know that there are talks uh, between European Union, Ukraine, and, and, uh, uh, and, and Russia also to facilitate these discussions, because for us it was clear that we did not want to put um, Ukraine in a position, or any country in that region in a position where they have to, cho to choose Either uh, you are with the EU or you with, uh, to, uh, with Russia. We believe perfectly that you can have an agreement with the European Union, and that does not mean that you are against uh, Russia. And this is also a mes message that we are trying to, to give uh, to them. We are perfectly, uh, we believe that they, that is a peaceful uh, existence that, that can, uh, that can um, exist. Um, and uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's our neighborhood, and, and they are very dear neighbors uh, to, uh, to us, and also some colleagues uh, of other dear uh, neighbors who are, 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 are with us. And I, I repeat, we don't want to make them a choice uh, that they have to choose uh, for the European Union or against the European Union or for or against Russia. We think that with the cooperation, that that's the history of the European Union. It's based on cooperation and not on confrontation, that we can really make progress if, if everybody goes in the same direction.
Thank you, Larry. It's my pleasure to, uh, well, sort of a pleasure to be able to close the last of the Ambassador Speaker Series for the academic year. Um, I would also like to point out that my colleague, Dr. P uh, Pauline Rankin, the Associate Vice President of Research International, would have liked to have been here, but she got called away at the last minute, so she should have been here to, to assist me in, in thanking our guests, but uh, she has been called away. So, Your Excellency, Excellency and, and distinguished guests, uh, thank you all for coming, but thank you especially to Your Excellency for this grand tour of uh, challenges that the EU faces and relations with Canada. Uh, I think it's uh, you're, you, you display great grace and tact in, in discussing some difficult issues. Uh, so we're very thankful that you could share your wisdom with us tonight. Um, as Larry said before, this is the last session, and I should point out that uh, every year um, at the in the summer, Larry and I and the Dean of the Faculty of Public Affairs, Andre, if he's still here, Andre. And this year, we'll be joined by Dr. Rajapaksa as well, uh, discuss which countries to try and have uh, the ambassador come and speak from. Uh, we make a decision, and then it's up to Larry to make sure that there are interesting things to discuss. So Larry, you outperformed yourself this time, We're having a refugee crisis, an economic treaty, all kinds of things for the ambassador to talk to us about tonight. So uh, with that, I would like to, again, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, there is a small memento of the occasion. Oh, uh, we present. Oh, that's nice.